And today we're talking about um, the subject about the how AI helps in cybersecurity. I'd like to call it cyber intelligence, which is cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. So um, a quick thing about me, God, this is a little bit um, blah, blah, blah about me. What do you want to know is like, um, what got me into this is like when I was in college in 1998, incidentally, I've done my first hack. It was totally incidentally slash accidentally, but I was able to get into the uh, the core uh, server in my in my college and see a lot of things that I wasn't supposed to see. This is this was like 1998. People would not have not known about cybersecurity yet. It was not a thing, but it just opened my eyes like how much a simple act could actually go um, and make you go or make somebody go have an access to things that they shouldn't have and how how dangerous could that be? So this is how it got me into it, and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, so let's go ahead. Let's dive in to the topics. We have five topics. It's it's usually um, an hour talk, but I'm just going to try and skim through fast. But I'm also willing to, um, you have my contact information. If anybody have anything, we could, uh, uh, I would love to have your questions or anything that you want through my email or any of my other contacts. So let's dive into, first of all, have a look at the security design practices. So usually we have something called uh, NIST. This is a framework, an international framework, to, to it was designed for cybersecurity, and it does not have to do anything with uh, with using AI or anything. This is what we do usually in cybersecurity. So there are five stages of any anything that it, whether you have an incident or you want to protect yourself from an incident that's going to happen, a data breach or whatever. So there are five steps. It's like first of all is to identify. Uh, to 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 realize if an incident happened to identify the cause or if it's not if it doesn't happen yet identify the causes that might they can happen in the future second of course to protect which is to outline the safeguards that facilitate the delivery of of, of a critical infrastructure it's just that infrastructure where people look, look at it it's like it's not just the devices and the firewalls that I put it's also the the people's behaviors in my corporate how do they um, act for that. How do they protect their code? They, they protect themselves. They protect their machines. It's a lot of things. And then we have to detect and to define the appropriate activities when something happened or when we expect something to happen, then respond to that, which means that it's able to immediately take an action of, of and detect that, that, that cyber um, uh, incident or the possibility of it and try to stop it or to control the damage, which is the fifth thing is to recover, whether it's if something happened and we want to recover the data or to recover the reputation or to recover the uh, the procedures that we had so that we can, um, if, you know, if you're predicting something that we can stop it from happening in the future. So basically all of the uh, cybersecurity and, and, and a lot of the um, cyber acts, cyber actions against security or bigger things are based on something that's good, the OODA loop, O-O-D-A, which are based on four principles, observe, orient, decide, and act. This is a, a principle that was created by uh, uh, General Joan Boyd in the U.S. Marine or U.S. Um, Navy, and it works for anything. It, it's not just for, for, it was actually done for the Army and the Navy, but we use that concept everything, for everything that is security. And it's, it's, it's a learning process. It goes into loops for us to to identify the, the, the things and to learn from the lessons from everything that we, every incident or every predicted incident that we have. So we have the first is observe, which which remains on the environment that we collect and understand uh, information, understand threats and the events that are come from many sensors uh, with, uh, you know, correlated with other events. Now, after we observe things, we have to orient. We have to start the orientation, orienting our experience and knowledge uh, so that because when we gain experience, we gain knowledge and we have to use that in recovering from every incident or learning to, 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 to predict something and stop it from happening in the future. So of every lesson that's learned, it's going to feed from the orientation to observation. And then we have to decide the decision is, is made of two things, hypothesis, which we have to create and say like, why do we think this is happening? And then we have to be creative if we don't know what procedure or it's a new thing then we have to be creative and we have to utilize this to to uh, to to the unknown or to the new tactics that we can uh, um you know 
used to solve these kinds of issues or to, to prevent them from happening. Again, after we decide, we have to act. Uh, that was uh, that also contains the mitigation. So, if as we said in this, which is used, which uses uh, practically uh, these principles, is how to recover, how to uh, to stop things from happening, to to predict things before they come. So, so that's all happening here, and also the lessons that we got to decide. So, the loop, this UDA loop is. Uh, it should go several times, sometimes on the same incident. We fail at the first loop. We don't understand. Then we go loop again, again. And then in other events, we use the other, the information that we learned from the other loops and then utilize it in here. So that is, these are like the concepts or the basic framework for us that we use in cybersecurity. Now, in this thing, I'm going to talk about how machines, how this is utilized in machines. Now, the first thing is a, a lot of people have heard about machine learning and, you know, AI, machine learning, how is it helping? So I just wanted to make it simple and to tell you from the beginning how an applied machine learning works for cybersecurity. So the most one of the most things that we do is the insider threats. As you know, uh, most of the uh, breaches or uh, hacks or anything like that happens from an insider uh, person, whether it's a. Uh, uh, some bunch of bad users, some uh, uh, disgruntled, previ uh, you know, employees, previous or ex-employees, or someone who has admin privileges, but they don't have enough skills to know that whatever they're doing is is a threat to their company. We have a lot of this, like a lot of examples like that. Of course, there's also malware analysis. Of course, everybody knows that. You mean like you download the software, you think it's fine, a game or a, an app on your phone, and it comes. Uh, it's a malware and it spies on you or it adds something or uses your phone to spam others. Also, we have network analysis, which is which goes on the hardware and we see the logs, we see the traffic that happens on everything that you use over the internet or in your internal uh, networking and we analyze that and it just happens very quickly. So if we want to do if we want to compare that to the human analysis to that, it's like it's like you compare years to seconds. Uh, also, we have also secure coding. As I said, um, you know, a lot of the software companies who are have like uh, professional coders or professional developers, they they know how to do um, great application. But sometimes most of them don't know that. Okay, if I use this, it might create uh, a problem with this uh, or a open security gap with this browser or with this server or with something like that. So uh, we also use AI to secure code and to predict. Uh, and so predict and protect uh, this code from having these security gaps and tell people that, okay, you should do that or these are these are the best practices or even block it from being executed. And uh, the final thing is the situational awareness. Of course, with incident or response, uh, such alerting security uh, is, is um, uh, uh, security officers quickly when an incident occurs. This is like, it, it gives us um, like, um, like kinds of alerts of, what is happening or what could happen as 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 alerts and so we can take an action to it all of that happened automatically with you know mostly no human intervention so the aspects of machine learning in cybersecurity is two major things classification which is for example the ability to recognize legitimate email and spam email so that's that's classification it classifies things according to the content subject the ip address that it came from and they said like this might be a spam and this might be legitimate. Of course, the accuracy is, you know, is not fully 100%, but some of those reaches like over 90%. And you can see that in your Gmail, in your Outlook, or whatever. And also forecasting. Forecasting is very important. It doesn't just because classification happens on data that we have, and we are, or something that we already uh, it's already in your inbox in this in in this example. But forecasting is to predict. Uh, what is going to happen. Like, for example, predict the number of intrusions ahead by looking into various patterns from historical data. So we look at the data and we say like, so last month we have all of these kinds of attacks from these kinds of these countries or from these IP addresses. So we expect this number from these places or from these IP addresses or new, new places or new users, new IP addresses. That's based on the data that we have, historical data. And historical data requires a lot of data. So the more data we have, the more uh, the accuracy we get. So the types of uh, machine learning or AI of the for the uh, uh, networks for for the AI is like two things. It's 
One of them is neural networks, with which is very basic. It's used like to make a decision, like, do you, are you uh, uh, able to get a mortgage, or or um, is that a cat or a dog? So it's just one input and one output. Uh, we have convolution neural networks, which is which works on multiple factors like facial recognition. Like we recognize every part of the face, and then we say this is the face of um, a specific person. But mostly you, those. We use those, but we also use Bayesian networks. And the Bayesian networks is, are like have multi factors into them, and specifically used, for example, to detect if if for uh, if that software is a malware or how much the possibility is, is that you are is that your phone is is like um, is is under threat or is compromised or your passwords are compromised. And they're, they're, these are examples of of uh, like a, uh, like if you have an alarm system and you have two neighbors, one of them. Um, one of them calls you every time that he hears something, not just the alarm, and the other one can call you can call you when an alarm happened, but she uses, for example, loud music, so you want to see the possibility of getting a call that is legitimate from the first one or not getting a call from uh, the second one while actually something is happening, which is John and Mary in this in this thing. Uh, this is an example. This you can find it also on the web, and this is the the URL. But this is how it goes. There are, as you can see, there are multiple factors, and there are hidden uh, behaviors by humans. We cannot not unexpect. This is why the Bayesian networks are very important to us. How does ML works? We have something called supervised machine learning, where where we teach the machines, giving them titles and cues for that. Unsupervised machine learning, where we tell uh, the machine to go and teach by itself, teach itself by itself. We don't put labels and all of these things. And we have semi-supervised machine learning, which we, where we use supervised and unsupervised. We teach them something and we let them learn something else. And we have reinforcement machine learning, which where we just tell them, go ahead, find the information, and and uh, do the whole job yourself. One of them is like uh, there was an example of a lot of machines learned many games, how to play games by watching other players watching the games. Now, 70% of machine learning products worldwide are used supervised learning. Now, with the supervised learning is used for something like malware specification, classification, spam identification, MLSEC project on firewall data. Uh, so unsupervised learning is used to DNS analytics, as you see, because there's always new new information, new DNS, new attacks, so it has to learn by itself and start to detecting this without us telling them. Threat intelligence feed curation, like IOC prioritization or deduplication, tier one analyst optimization, which you know have worked. Uh, there was study said like it reduced workload from 600 million raw events to 100 incidents. Uh, so you also user identity behavior, like if the user, if if the hacker is using someone's uh, account. And uses it in different times. So it says like this is not the normal behavior of this user. So maybe this account is might be actually compromised. So deep learning in cybersecurity, we use it for uh, automated feature extraction, high detection accuracy, and issues. But the issues with the deep learning is like we need a lot of data. As we said, few records cannot be good to say uh, good from bad. Not much enough information with flaws. It doesn't have a context, as we mean. It doesn't think still like a human being, and labels are not available for most of the time. So it needs to be a mix of all of things. So AI advantages in cybersecurity. We have spam filters applications. We have network intrusion app detection application, fraud detection, credit scoring, botnet detection, secure uh, user authentication, and cybersecurity ratings, and also hacking incident forecasting. Now, we're going to talk about things that's very important here. This is you heard about something on the dark web and the dark web people think about it like it's a it's a very dangerous place which it is but what we don't know that it's 40 percent of it's legal like personal sites groups activism uh private legal sell and buy etc but 60 percent and that's until 20 late 2019 are stolen user data credit card information social security or social insurance number pedophilia cyber terrorism etc and this study, according to 19, this is this is the information that we've got, and it's actually had risen by 20% compared to 2016. And we expect that during this year, because of COVID and work from home and all, these things are these numbers are going to get higher and higher. So the application for uh, fighting dark web is to scan the dark web content to see if there somebody is planning something. Uh, applications that try to find and catch pedophiles, for example, solution to check if your credentials were compromised. There's a website for that called 
uh, uh, have I been pawned? A solution to check on phishing domains, the domains that try to send you something uh, which partial uh, targeted to you or targeted to a group to get more data from you and then they can complete a profile and then hack into your accounts. Solution to detect financial stolen data like credit card information, SIN numbers, SSN number, bank account, etc. And to detect malware behavior patterns and block them. So um, we also use AI to fight cyber terrorism. Now I worked as in cyber terrorism. I have done a lot of solutions in, in mass surveillance and cyber terrorism. So the most thing that we use them for is to identify content that empathize with terror or terrorists, uh, profile possible targets for recruitment. And this is very important because this is where a lot of recruiting happen, happens all over the internet, uh, connect relations between possible terror cells, like these cells that work all around the world and in, from different things to attack, uh, to, to plan attacks. On, on different kind, these are like either cyber attacks or physical attacks, and to catch terror plans before the execution, or to track terrorists before and after an attack. And this is either like a digital attack or a physical attack. This is one of the examples. This is this was one of the sites. It's in Arabic, but it's it, it's a site that was on the dark web that looks like uh, this is this article talks about Times Square. It's like it looked like it is a, a tourism a tourism kind of a site, but tells people in hidden, like these are the places that you want to target for terrorist attack because there's a lot of people that are coming, it's busy in these times and all. So this is, this is uh, 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 part of what, what the AI could catch and, and do for that. So one also example for that is the hacker leased passwords for more than 500,000 servers, routers, and IoT devices. Okay, now, um, one of the topics that got me um, into this after working on all of these things is the fairness of AI. Because we talk now too much about, and you know that the unrest that happens in the United States and multiple parts of the world is that the, there's a lot of uh, you know um, unfairness with dealing with different groups, different ethnic groups or religious groups or whatever. And this happens also in, in, in using AI because AI is, is using data that we humans feed into him. So the, so, uh, the major things that we care about or we are worried about is fairness against and discrimination, the ownership, the transparency of the data and, and you know, about what we deal with the data. And I highlighted two of these things because we've heard a lot about them in the past few years by social media leaks or breaches like privacy and accountability. Like when, you, when they leak your private data or give it to someone who would, might use it against you, that is that is something that you didn't want to and you didn't sign up for and who's accountable for this because we saw com corporations throw you know pointing fingers at each other and no one takes a, a real responsibility or accountability we also talk about anonymity confidentiality identity and identity protection and the reputation because leaking out this data could affect all of that now the main cause of eye biases is like the design how we design those solutions how do we make them work, how do they analyze what type of access they give to whom. The, they're also data exploration. Where does the data come from? Does it, how does it look like? Is it, is it accurate or not? Um, how was it entered? Who entered it? And there's also the data processing. How was that data cleaned after it was entered? Had we checked, is it ready for use? Is it cleaned from biases or from uh, anything like that? We have also the prototyping that how do we develop the, to the model? Does it work? Should we pivot? Uh, we also have to look at the production. Can we harden the scale up the model, harden it up from a security or from a privacy point of view, whatever. And we have the maintenance because after once we put that, the, the data is going to come bigger and bigger and the analysis of this data is going to come bigger and bigger. And so how do we maintain that? Okay, so how does bias happen? First of all, human biases affect both data and design because people who put the data and people who are designing this solution. So it's tackled down to the issues and problems uh, that keep piling up with a greater difficulty to solve day by day. And if we keep kept on doing that, AI data is growing very fast and this is going to make the problem bigger and bigger. Uh, the social and political climate, um, you know, I don't want to go political here, but some when you you notice that when a government comes with a different agenda for 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 different uh, type of issues of political issues that affects because, for example, like um, there was in the United States, for example, there was a, a move to uh, to add in the in the census in the American census 
the origins or if, if where, where the country you came from or something like that. And that was politically pushed. But if we put that, and thank God it, it didn't go, but if we put that, that might cause a lot of biases against minorities in the United States. So that's what we're talking about, is that all the biases in the AI are caused by human beings and how political and uh, social climate could cause that as well. Now, we to 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 look at that, we have something called bias various variance trade-off. Uh, well, it's a center. Pro this is a central problem, and it's uh, in supervised learning because, as we said, supervised learning, uh, you know, deals with data that comes from human. And the more data that comes from humans, the more bias we should expect from that. Um, but there are something that we call something like this trade-offs that sometimes we might actually uh, go on and create a, a specific bias to solve a human bias. Like, for example, we have in healthcare, we know that usually women's um, um, uh, uh, blood pressure ha have different different sig significance to, to men. So men d can have a higher blood pressure, but it does not affect their bodies. But women can have a lower blood pressure than men, but it affects their bodies. That's 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 a physical thing between males and females. So what we've done is in a lot of solutions, we pushed the, al the alert for... Um, the type of blood pressure according to the gender. So if it's a female, so it, if she has this uh, this blood pressure, let's say 135 over 85, that would that would equal 140 over 90 for a man. So we push that and we create that trade-off to solve a bias. And you know these are just some charts to show you how we can do that with this buffering, with high bias, a good compromise, how we solve it, and overfitting which is high variance. And the more we get this to the more difficult the the algorithm and the solution we have to build fears of bias in in uh, in, in AS cyber security incomplete or wrong data uh, malicious actor including uh, nation states you know rogue states are using ai to undermine security of others most sophisticated defenses against cybersecurity is the kind of defenses employed by large corporations and nation state as we said machine learning could be used also to create poisons poison dual scenarios uh, the AI process is in a black box. That's a lot of people ask us, like, we don't know how these AIs getting these uh, their uh, decisions, which is what's pushing now for AI explainability. Humans are still in control and humans are biased in nature. We have adversarial attacks are significantly easy for people who are experts in designing and understanding AI algorithm. And it's, what's an er adversarial attack? I'll do it with, with a simple example. This is a photo of a panda. And we, when we get it to it, it says Panda with 57.7 with confidence. When we added this noise, with, uh, um, uh, with the, when we first tell, tell the AI to see that, it's, it said that it's a nematode. Uh, but we, when we add it, this was the image. We couldn't see it with a human eye, but an AI said it's a gibbon. And actually, this is what a gibbon looks like. So this is what an adversarial attack. Uh, so if you're interested in AI, of course, something I, I'm writing and a uh, paper, if you want, you can contact me. We'll, do, we'll, uh, we'll share the information. And there's a talk about ethical AI. Now, the last topic, which is we'll get very quickly, is AI vs. humans. Of course, there was always uh, this battle between humans and technology, who takes, who takes place, who takes jobs from each other. And the thing is, always AI is, is scary to a lot of people, specifically here in Canada. I have a TED talk about that if you want to look at it. But uh, what I'm seeing here is that we have we have a trade-off between both. Humans are generally intelligent. The intelligence cannot be matched by any current machine. We have a general intelligence. Uh, we have a unique compassion that the machine doesn't have. We have, but we also have limited memory and amount of energy. Uh, we are also emotional and biased, and our learning learning cycle starts from scratch. Every generation, uh, you know, teaches to the other generation its goal cycle, and human can work in groups, for that matter, and they have common goals. We see that some some people beating AI for, with, with working together. Now, what's good about machine? They are obedient, non-stop. They don't, they don't complain. Uh, they are not, don't forget. Are, and their memory are transferable. You can transfer it easy within seconds from a machine to another. Biases are inherited from humans. They do not and uh, know the biases. That's one thing that is not good. Non-emotional, which is not giving them, making them uncompassionate and understanding for some, in some cases, which gets some people into trouble. We are unable to make a final determination that make a total sense for humans, and but also they are faster and could give accurate uh, decisions, and they create solutions 
to fight cybersecurity, you know, faster than than human. And the last word is that for a better word, I think machines and humans should work together. And and until we get to to the better solutions, uh, we let them work on what they want and get get out some data. And we have our humanity, uh, you know, do the other list. I'll, I'd like to think to uh, close with this. I've heard that in one conference about AI. It says like there is no match for human integrity, for in, for human ingenuity and empathy. I do believe in that. Although I'm an AI guy, but I still believe in that. And uh, after this, I'd like to thank you all. Uh, this is my. Um, uh, these are my uh, contacts. If you want, of course, after this this conference, you can reach out to me via anything. I think we uh, need now to go to uh, uh, the questions. Um, so if anybody have any questions, please um, post them here and we'll answer them. Okay, so Julie Lin Wong says thank you. Um, most welcome, Julie. Anybody have any questions, comments, anything? We still have three minutes to spare. Again, Julie Ling Wong said you did such a great job. Thank you very much again. Uh, you're making me blushing. <laughs> so, uh, but thank you. And uh, um, I would say that if you have anything, even after the, um, uh, the conference, you can see my contacts on the screen. On the last slide, uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions or to help you with anything regarding cybersecurity or AI in cybersecurity.